I'm gonna try this, all right? Uh, this is something I just thought of, and it's kind of like, all right, slugs. It's not quite working. Slugs. Okay, it's starting to work. Yeah, it just kind of brings a smile to one, doesn't it? I don't know. I think it does. All right, uh, I can do that because I'm an entomologist, right? Well, I'm going to have a slide here that shows that slugs are not insects, all right? And uh, indeed, uh, it was so wonderful to have Ron Hammond for many, many years taking on the slug talks throughout the Midwest and uh, because nobody else wanted to do it. All right, and uh, he did an excellent job, and some of his slides are in here. Uh, but, uh, you know, things progress. We've learned a few things about them. Hopefully I'll share some. Uh, this is uh, kind of the outline that we're going to do for the next hour. All right, hour of slugs. All right, here we go. All right, uh, I, I'm going to throw a little bit of unexpected stuff here initially here. All right, so bear with me, and that is... Uh, this is not rocket science, okay? Uh, and uh, as we get into some of these very interesting situations, lack of tillage, more cover crops, et cetera, uh, folks, we got to be scouting. So I could probably end it right here, but I've been committed to it a whole hour, and you got to get your points, all right? So here we go. Uh, and I, I want to really make, again, this emphasis that... Uh, as we've got different, again, mostly plant-type materials out there, there are critters, note I said critters, that are going to take advantage of it because that becomes their home and their food, and, uh, and all living things need that, all right, uh, including slugs. All right, uh, so... I want to talk about uh, diversity, all right? On and university campuses, you got to be real careful with uh, diversity. Uh, you have to be very all-inclusive, et cetera. Uh, not so much uh, there, but uh, we're talking about um, the diversity of little things that are going bump in the night. Uh, and uh, this is one of the ways we collect them. This is, uh, write this down. This is high tech here, all right? This is called a pitfall trap. All right, uh, you can see that it's nothing more than a cup or some type of collector with a funnel that fits sort of close. And then at the bottom, you put some antifreeze. You want to try to make it nice and level with the ground. Oop, that didn't do what I thought it would do. Let's see which one works better here. Yeah, I like that. I like that better. All right. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, the lasers don't do so well on that. But anyway, so we want it to be kind of nice and level with the surface. And the idea here is that anything, again, crawling around on the ground is uh, eventually going to fall in here and then uh, be collected. The antifreeze is uh, a way to kill them humanely, all right? We don't want them to be harmed, all right? Uh, and the other is that... Uh, it's a nice preservative, so you can actually keep them in there for several days, if not weeks, and still kind of tell what they are over time. All right, uh, and oh, too, they had a little roof on top to uh, try to keep the rain out. So this is what a tr uh, fancy dandy trap looks like out at our training center. We put these out in different types of uh, uh, plots with uh, different uh, tillages, etc., cover crops, and here it is with the rain roof and not too exciting. Note that I have a flag here because I need to be able to find those things, all right? All right, so this is uh, removing the rain shield and of course the funnel. And you see down below the uh, collecting vial. And this is looking down into the uh, antifreeze and all the little critters that are collected. So the, the light ones or the small ones typically float and the big heavy duty ones, they sink. All right, and, uh, and so you got to mix the whole thing up, pour it out, and then try to collect or figure out what's in there. Here's a group doing just that. Uh, we uh, collect the antifreeze in a different container to be disposed of properly. Did you note that? All right, anyone listening? And then, uh, of course, uh, what they're doing now is they've got all the little critters down on a, out on a breadboard and sorting through it. And it's usually a lot of this, what is that? Okay, it's ooh, that type of thing. 
But uh, for the most part, this is what we find. Pest species. Gee, go figure. All right. We kind of knew that they, they were there. So various cutworm species, as well as armyworm species, and certainly slugs. All right. And, uh, and then here's the good news. We find a lot of ground beetles. And uh, there's other uh, beetles, such as rove beetles, even fireflies that are predators. Find lots of different spiders, big ones, little ones, and then uh, other things as well. So lots of things that are also trying to eat on those pest species we just saw. And then mostly we find this. I'm going to just kind of clump them in the... Uh, the cleanup crew, all right, so the decomposers. So we got earthworms. Anybody know what an earthworm looks like? All right. I, de I did put a picture up there, right, just for those who didn't know. You know, the pill bugs, the millipedes, and so forth. Uh, here's one of the big groups that uh, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. Matter of fact, science really doesn't understand these springtails all that much. <laughs> We're just starting to be... Uh, to, be a little bit more focused on them, especially as we get into some of these long-term uh, cover crop situations where we've got a whole different uh, zoo out there living that we didn't realize before. And uh, springtails are a big part of it because they help, of course, decompose, but they're also a food source for some of those other critters, such as the spiders and ground beetles, etc., when there aren't any pest species. All right, um, I'm a longtime IPMer, just like Curtis, and uh, this is my favorite little thing from John Muir from many years ago. He's a famous naturalist, took wonderful pictures, by the way. And uh, so we see this. We saw this decades ago, and we see it today, and that is when we start thinking we got it figured out, we tug, and then we find out, Oh, crap. There's other things happening here we did not realize. All right. Can anyone formulate a thought in their mind of what maybe one of these are? All right. So I'm an old bug guy. I immediately think of DDT. It was going to save the world, right? And in some cases, it did. All right. You think about it. As far as yellow fever and stuff, especially during the war, but uh, the big war, I should say, and, and then, but what did we find out? Well, there were some environmental negatives to it, all right? Think of uh, Roundup Ready beans when it first came out. Gosh, that was easy to control weeds. Pretty inexpensive, too, compared to what we had been doing. And now we've got a room full of people in a dicamba training because now... It ain't working like it used to, all right? So now, who knows with this uh, new systems, who knows what's going to be the consequence that we're going to learn from a few years from down the road. So I think you know where I'm going. There's lots of interesting things that intertwine here, all right? But uh, I think one of the challenges here as we get into more intensive situations is creating, maintaining and I'm even going to put another slash there, understanding what is a healthy soil. There is no perfect definition, and there is no perfect understanding of what that really is. All right? And, of course, slugs is just one of the many, many things now involved with as we create all these residues. All right, so let's go on. Um, what is not a slug? A snail. All right, uh, oftentimes uh, a slug is defined as what? Snail without a shell. Yeah, excellent, there it is. A snail without a shell. Well, this is a snail. And uh, I don't know whether it really is a pest or not. Now, I did meet with one producer this past winter. He farms uh, some down, way down in the Ohio River. Basically Kentucky, all right. So, and uh, but basically the the thing is, he told me he had snails to the point where they destroyed his crop. I, I have no proof of it. I have no pictures or anything. But it 
it's kind of like, so it's the first time I'd heard of it as actually being a pest. In other words, I've seen them before, not that big a deal. Uh, you think slugs are hard to control. Lordy, how are we going to kill these things, huh? All right. So, and slugs are not insects. I already gave that away. All right, even though you can have some insects that are slimy, legless, and can be damaging, but uh, of course, they're different. And the reason I only bring it up is not to insult you, but just to remind you that insecticides do not, I'm going to say it again, do not work on slugs. They're completely different. Right. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, and I'm sure you were, this is courtesy of the forensics folks, and that's a blowfly larva, and of course they feed on flesh. All right. So just in case you were wondering. All right, so here we go into slugs. Are you ready? All right, uh, it starts off as an egg. Now the eggs, for the most part, uh, overwinter. Some laid probably in the spring and probably in the fall, but for the most part, we're talking about eggs that are overwintering. Uh, I did go out and look at my wife's uh, flower bed near our hosta, and uh, I had no problem finding slug eggs. So they're doing quite well, at least for Lafayette, Indiana, okay? Uh, and then they become juveniles. All right, uh, first they're really, really tiny. So I hope you can see that that is a penny there, and that is a newly hatched juvenile. And then they get bigger, and this is when they're dangerous to us in our crops. Because this is like a, uh, this is like a teenager. All right, uh, and what do teenagers do? And I'm thinking of more of teenage boys. What do they do with food? Anyone ever raise a teenage boy? Man, it disappears, all right? So the point being is they eat a lot. All right, uh, and then, of course, they become adults. And then the cycle continues. Now, they've got it made because uh, they're actually both male and female. So mating can actually occur with themselves, but typically it will be with another slug, all right, because it's better for the genetic flow of certainly. So uh, anyway, how do you know it's an adult from a juvenile? You ask them, all right. That was a joke, all right. And then how else do you know? Well, if you catch them laying eggs, then you know it's an adult, okay? Uh, uh, these uh, juveniles can be pretty darn close and yet not there. Okay, so, uh, and, and, okay, don't get scared. All, all of a sudden it's kind of like, oh my gosh, he's going to talk about the different slug species. I am not an expert in this area. I'm going to give you two species, all right? This is the one you're most likely to encounter. Okay, it's called the gray garden slug. I have no idea why it's called gray, because it's white and it's black and it's, I guess, gray. All right, uh, I guess you mix the colors and you get gray, right? But uh, this is probably the one, again, you're probably likely to come against. As a matter of fact, you go anywhere in the, not only the U.S., but anywhere in the world. Likely if you see a slug, it's going to be one of these, unless you're talking about the big banana slugs or something like that. Uh, and uh, the juveniles, once again, are the most problematic. And fortunately, it's only one generation per year. All right, so there you go. One more to do, the marsh slug. Now, this one is indigenous. In other words, it's always been here as far as we know. Oh, by the way, I have sought literature and I've asked questions, and I cannot find how a slug originates in a given field. Have you ever wondered that? It's kind of like, uh, you know, I've been farming this, you know, my family's been farming this for 100 whatever years, and all of a sudden, it's kind of like they're a problem this year. It's kind of like, where'd they come from? And uh, simply, there is no answer to that question. 
It's just they are here, okay? The, uh, the gray garden slug I came in sometime in the 1800s, likely, of course, from Europe. But uh, as far as this dude, uh, it's probably always been there in fields, taking advantage of it. Of course, in, with the marsh especially, it's generally in a very, very wet environment, kind of as its name implies. All right, uh, so again, it's common but not as damaging. And I, I actually, you know, I was selecting through my slides and I looked at this and I looked at this and it's kind of like, I'm not even absolutely certain whether this is a gray garden or not. But for all intents and purposes, this is a marsh slug, okay? It's small and it's black. All right, uh, here we go. So damage to corn. Have we seen some interesting damage on corn? Of course, you know that there's damage on soybean and really just about anything. But uh, here it is on corn. This is, if you didn't realize it, this is severe damage. All right. No chuckles here. Okay. This is severe damage. All right. Uh, in other words, it's completely gone. The slugs just <laughs> ate it down in a nubbin. All right. How do I know that there was a slug involved without even start pulling up the residues and looking for them? Yeah, this, it's been slimed to death, okay? All right, that's right. It's just full of slime on there. All right, uh, here's a pretty bad damage on seedlings, but it doesn't excite me as much as the previous picture, all right, because it's what's lacking here, or what should I say, what is different about this versus this? This is all in the foliage, all right, which is bad enough on a seedling while it's trying to get going, but uh, fortunately, nothing low, other than where they pulled it out of the ground, all right? And then, of course, uh, this doesn't excite me at all. But this is generally when I'm called out to a field to assess a slug situation. And it's kind of like, what are you worried about? All right, uh, I think you can clearly see that uh, we have quite a bit of leaf feeding. And I bet it was kind of exciting about a week before this or two. But... Uh, all this new growth, uh, there is no damage whatsoever. So what's happening here? You've heard the old phrase, it'll grow out of the damage, or it'll grow faster than the damage, or, and so forth. Well, that's what's happening here. We're finally getting some warmth and sunshine. Okay, uh, now slugs with soybean. This is bad. As soon as they start dinking with the uh, hypocotyl, I mean, the seed damage is one thing, but uh, when you mess with the vascular system to the roots, uh, it's a goner. All right, that soybean plant is dead. It just doesn't know it yet. All right, uh, and then, of course, here's uh, another situation where, again, they're feeding the hypocotyls and the seed. And then uh, here where some of the damage early on, meaning in the seed as well as the first unifoliate leaves, you can see the results once it has emerged. This uh, cotyledon is only about half as large as it should be, etc. How do you think that soybean uh, plant will do now, this one on the right? How do you think it will do? Am I losing you guys? Come on, hang with me. I think this is fascinating. This is slugs, all right? Yeah, I think it's going to do just fine. All right, again, it's that below, below ground stuff that I'm concerned about. And that leads me to put this slide in here. All right, uh, so slugs. I think, potentially, I can't say that it is for sure, but I think it could be the most damaging pest as we continue to... Uh, increase these residues, cover crops, however you want to say it, in the field. And uh, the reason I say that is because I think they will always be present in those environments. Always. Because they can feed on both dead and decaying, as well as live things. And they don't care. They will live and do fine on either one of those situations. And uh, I think this is very important 
to bring the light here is that uh, here, I don't know if you can pick that out or not, but this is a seed slot of, where soybean seeds and their hypocotyls are down there. And uh, the slug is feeding day and night down there because it's nice and dark. Yes, a question. So I know they, they feed on both, but do they have a preference for a plant over a dying plant or a dead plant? Yeah, it's a very fair question. I don't know if you heard it or not, but would they prefer dead or a living plant? Well, the only way I can answer this is I know in my wife's flower bed once again that uh, I can find them under the wood mulch, but I also find, or my wife finds them damaging or hostile, sometimes to the point where they chew it all the way down to the ground. So I guess the point is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to your question. It's a very good one. Uh, I, I think that uh, in the situation where if we've got, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later, if we've got very moist and uh, mild evenings, I think they're going to be up on plants feeding. But I think that if there's any type of harshness to the environment at all, in other words, certainly d during the day, but I'm talking about even in the night, if there's a little bit of wind or something like that, I think they're going to be down below feeding on dead stuff or the root system, which is worse. But anyway, that's what I'm trying to get here is that uh, this is bad, all right? I don't know if you went to Connolly's talk here a little bit ago, but, uh, you know, he said, SDS, bad, all right? So I'm just going to say this, uh, that uh, open seed slot, bad. All right, uh, so this comes from Ron, almost directly, and that is, uh, as far as sampling form, I sometimes hesitate to uh, talk to groups about slug sampling, because I'm not even sure anybody would do it, for one. Because you'll see that it's not exactly, you know, uh, uh, exciting, all right? And, and you have to do it, for the most part, late at night. All right, um, so I think there's some good points to be taken here, though, is that at slug populations in the spring appear to follow population trends present in the fall. In other words, if you have some idea of what your slug population was in 17 and certainly had some clue of the population going into the fall, of a given field, then I think for 18, this coming season, that I think you would have some kind of clue of your threat. Make sense? Okay, and I put this little caveat in here, and that is, they survive the winter pretty darn good. So, you know, the question is, I get this in insects all the time, will they survive this you know, we had a cold period from January 1 to about the 20th of January, whatever that was. All right, it was pretty cold. All right, but from what I can tell, the slugs are doing just fine. And what really, really adds to that, of course, is I always like that phrase, blanket of snow. People don't realize it when they're saying that. They're actually talking about how it's protecting insects and or slugs all right, from very harsh, cold environments. All right, so it's a nice insulator. And then the other portion of this, although predicting the slug density probably will not be possible, determining the presence and or absence of slugs is useful. All right. So in other words, sampling information is good, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have an outbreak. I think is what it's basically saying. All right, uh, so how are we going to scout for them? I can tell you scouting for them during the day is really, really tough. All right, you've got to move a lot of residues, uh, soil peds, et cetera, to find them. Uh, it's easier in the middle of the night. Okay, it's not great for family time, but the point being is <clears throat> using a flashlight out there and, uh, and scoping them, because they're out 
Very, very active, of course. Now, researchers, they use uh, the, the general standard is using some type of roofing shingle. And uh, if you're with me, you know, if you've ever shingled a roof, here I'm talking about the ones that come in like threes, all right, and then, but these of course are cut into three. So you've got one little shingle or a portion of shingle. And, uh, and now some, uh, was it Delaware, they like to cover them in aluminum foil. But uh, Penn State, John Tucker's group, he likes to just throw them out as is. They like to get them as close. In other words, you just don't throw it, but you actually place it down close to the soil as possible. He likes the, uh, the white ones. Uh, the name is with um, uh, Owens Corning is actually Shasta. All right, uh, because uh, he thinks that it reflects enough light during the day that it doesn't get too hot under there. Otherwise, the slugs are not going to go there if it's too hot, even in the night. All right, uh, and then uh, I think uh, this always brings a chuckle, so I'm going to bring it up, all right? And that is beer sampling does work, all right, in shallow containers. Here's a result. This is years ago research, but... Uh, of course, this was placed into the soil just a little bit. It's not this petri dish isn't very deep, but still, you have to get it down as flat to the soil surface as possible because the idea is this beer will attract the slugs, and the intent is, of course, to get them to drop in and uh, and drown. All right. Uh, now. I think it's important to note too that the literature actually says that. You need fresh beer, not flat beer, all right? And I think you're going to see here in a second, you can't just use the cheap stuff, all right? And drink the good stuff for yourself, all right? All right, uh, so there's some ideas. Now, uh, here if we have enough time, in the end, I'm going to share with you a little story down in, uh, from southern Indiana. And uh, the, the farm manager asked me, well, what should I do? And I suggested just throwing out some pieces of scrap plywood. And that works too, all right? So most of these things you can do at home, all right? Uh, hopefully this will work, but I want to show you this. Uh, this is on YouTube, and because it was from the Internet, it's true, all right? But uh, somebody did an incredible job with this time lapse. And uh, he, uh, well, I'll just, uh, I, I sped it up some because it actually is about uh, three minutes long. But... Uh, Hopefully you'll see, he just pours in the, the beer, and actually he's using artificial light now. It's, it's nighttime. Now slugs don't move like that, all right, in real life, but, uh, <laughs> but look how this thing just comes alive. Yep. It's kind of cool how they kind of, you can actually see the slithering. I think that's really neat, all right. But uh, what, did, uh, did, what did you notice as far as how well this did as far as collecting sampling for the slugs? Yeah. I only saw one big black one fall in, and I watched the, long, the, the full length one, and I watched it several times. And he think, I think that was the same one that came back, I think, for a third time. So, <laughs> all right, I'm serious. <laughs> it was good for a chuckle, too, but I'm serious. All right. So uh, he had had enough, but uh, the point being is, other than utilizing this in a home garden or something like that, I, I can't put a whole lot of stock into it, all right? Uh, you're certainly not going to do it in an 80-acre field or something like that, so. All right, so let's get to the, <laughs> the real fun stuff here, all right? Uh, believe it or not, uh, colleague uh, Whitney Crenshaw, it, at Colorado State University, did this research with different types of beer. How he got funded for this. <laughs> but anyway, we could say a lot of things about this. But I think he used, it ended up that he used uh, Budweiser was his standard, all right? And, uh, and then you could see how the others, the, the higher the number, the more slugs it was attracting, or how more the better effective it was. And interestingly, the uh, Kingsbury malt beverage, I didn't know this, but it's non-alcoholic, all right? So if you tend to go that way, that, there you go. Here's a good sampling tool for you. 
But um, my uh, my the the my former boss, uh, Rich Edwards, uh, uh, retired now, but uh, he had this uh, six pack rule, and I always really liked that. And uh, I'm going to share this with you today, and that is, you go out there with your six pack, all right, and your little containers that you're going to pour this in, and you pour a little bit in and you drink the rest of the beer. All right, you go to the next sampling site. All right, and I think you can see the sequence. By the time you're done with your six pack, you don't care about your slugs anymore. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, all right? So, all right, so that's what I had to say about as far as beer and sampling. Um, but the, the others, again, there's possibilities with shingles and or pieces of scrap wood or something, just to kind of get an idea, because they will accumulate under there as it becomes daytime, and then, of course, uh, you will lift them up and see what type of populations. All right, um, so this is, uh, I call it considerations. I don't call it control. We do not have slug control. <coughs> All right, so just make sure you under, we're all in the same situation here, understanding that there is no such thing as slug control. All right, so here's some considerations. All right, first off, plant early as possible. All right, and you're going to see why here in, just, um, in the next slide as far as the potential slug activity. But again, this is a tricky one. You want to plant early, but not too early, all right? So in other words, we don't want planting into soils that aren't ready yet. And this becomes a challenge as we have lots of residues sitting on the soil, certainly, right? Uh, so we don't want that open seed slot. I think I kind of beat that to death. I don't need to say it again, but that's, that's bad, all right? Now... This again comes from Ron, and uh, this was kind of a schematic he made up years ago. Still very uh, much applies to, uh, to today, but uh, and I think the uh, the time frame is still very accurate. In other words, here is where we get into our situation because we have some overwintering adults. but more importantly, we have those eggs, especially with the gray garden slug that they are hatching, and they're really, really tiny. You saw the one on top of a penny. This is where they're really, really tiny. They're not going to eat much. They don't have big raspers at that point, all right? But this is the teenage slugs, all right? These are the ones that are a problem. And you can kind of see this time period here. We're talking about, especially in that mid-May period into early June. So, in other words, if we've got crop just planted or just emerging at that particular point in time, this is when we can get into some real situations as far as yield reductions, stand losses. All right. And that's why they plant early, but not too early. All right, let's go on. Here's, a, here's rocket science. All right. This is where a little bit of prayer can go a long way, but uh, certainly perhaps something like a, a starter fertilizer. In other words, give that plant every opportunity. And I'm talking, of course, both corn and soybean here. Give it every opportunity it can to get out of that ground and get going. Receive that sunshine that's out. And, of course, any warmth available at that time, too. And uh, this is one of my rules, because where I've seen some real situations, hairy situations, is when now with some of these grassy cover crops, I'll let you name the species, but uh, they're standing nice and pretty, and then they either get crimped or they get uh, self, or the crop destruct, all right? And they tend to just lay right over and they start matting right on the soil surface. You've seen this before, all right? Guess what's underneath? It's perfect for slugs. It's dark, it's moist. 
and then they have either weeds or your crop to feed on should they choose. All right, here it is. Now, some farmers don't like it when you talk about tillage. All right, and I understand about setting back a field many, many years by doing just that because you have so much building up on that soil surface. All right, but one possibility, and I think this is kind of a cop out because I, this has not been tested, but many people will talk about it, is that doing some type of zone tillage. In other words, what we're basically trying to do here is convince the slug to stay here and not go to the emerging crop. That's all it is. Will it work? I don't know. It's possible. Now, if we've got a zone or an area of a field that's just slug city, there's nothing better than a little bit of light tillage. I've said it, all right? Um, I don't know, what's the idea? Are the discs gonna actually kill the slug? I just wanna make sure we all are in the same place here. What's the idea here? Yeah, okay, all of these are fair. Yeah, comments, good. So in other words, if we're just disturbing that environment, all right? And getting underneath dried as much as possible is certainly a part of it. There's lots of negatives with this, I understand. All right, this is absolute last resort in my book. Now, Ron had done some research with these baits and had some successes. I've not seen the same thing. Uh, you know, for one, let's start off that it ain't cheap. All right? And the other is it's problematic to get these things spread evenly. Some people have tried seed spreaders, you know, on ATVs, et cetera. Some have uh, spread it with potash or something like that. To some degree, but you can, I don't know if you can see these little blue pellets sitting there. This is the kind of placement that you would ideally have. So in other words, a slug would encounter it. They're not going to be attracted to it like the beer. There's not that fermentation effect. All right, uh, a little bit about, about metaldehyde, which is the only real act, active ingredient we have. We do have some phosphide baits that uh, I think are questionable. But uh, metaldehyde will work. Uh, interesting, read that first bullet. What does that say? It will work if they eat enough. But they may not eat enough because it actually repels them as well. And the way it actually uh, works, uh, understand that metaldehyde is actually a basically a byproduct, and it comes from the Swiss, all right? And uh, the way it works is the slug's mucus cells actually disrupt, or uh, rupture, that's what I want to say. And so these cells start rupturing and continually expel the muc mucus, all right? Uh, but they may stop feeding before they slime to death, basically, all right? So the environment can change, and they may stop eating, etc. One little uh, home story once again. Stories are always nice, aren't they? All right. Tell me a story, Dad. All right. In other words, uh, my wife had some green bean in her garden. Well, she does every year, but uh, slugs were problematic. I happen to have some of these baits, all right? They were available to me, so why not use them, right? Uh, so I spread them out, then I went out at night to see how they, were, how they were faring. And I actually observed slugs actually working around the baits. What's that all about, okay? Now I'm not, again, I'm not saying they don't work, but you gotta convince the slug to eat it instead of your plant. And that's the tricky thing. All right, and uh, 
I think important too here that uh, sometimes folks are anticipating a slug problem, they're going to go ahead and put baits down with planting and it might be too soon because you saw the, uh, the timing where we've got the little baby slugs and then the juvenile teenage slugs and those are the ones we want to attack. And this is always fun. It, farmers are fun people because they're so creative and they come up with different things and 28% nitrogen. Why in the heck would that work? And there you go. So basically we're trying to think of how can we get a high salt solution to those slugs. Who in here has ever salted a slug? Anyone who would to admit to it? Thank you. Anybody else? This is confession time, folks. <laughs> All right. Anybody? <laughs> it's pretty cruel, isn't it? Earthworms too. Earthworms too. Oh, sir, I think there's a room for you just down the way. <laughs> All right. Understand that uh, if one were to spray in a controlled environment, this would be it. In other words, it's very, it's in the middle, okay, or it's after midnight, okay? And God bless you if you have nothing else to do, all right? And then it's completely calm. Observations from researchers out, uh, in, out in the East Coast have found that any type of wind at all, the slugs are still down below. It has to be completely calm. And then you have to have a very heavy dew. So consider these things if you're going to try something like this. All right. And I'm going to show you another slide here in just a minute, but uh, I do want to address this right now. Lanate, which is an old uh, organophosphate insecticide, does not work. I don't know where this got started. Some folks down on the river in southern Indiana tried this, and they had nothing but lots of money invested for no results. I think what has happened is larvin used to be the active ingredient we used in baits long ago, and it is no longer available to us because it was very, very toxic to earthworms and other animals as well. All right? But lanate, old stinky insecticide, does not work. All right. All right. If you want good results with your 28% application, this is what your crop will look like afterwards. <laughs> okay, take your choice, all right? All right. Is it mom? Okay, well, all right. <laughs> Let me address a couple questions here real quick before you don't want to miss this Academy Award winning video right now. Yes, sir. How about deadline? Deadline bullets. Well, that's, again, the, the pellets, the metaldehyde pellets, and that's what that is. The only, different, the only different kind of one out there is the uh, phosphide bait. It's called Sluggo. Uh, my understanding is it's not as effective as metaldehyde, so, or deadline bullets. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Uh, how many gallons per acre? On oh, joy. <laughs> <laughs> the more good. You saw the picture before this one. I don't know, what does it take to make it look like that? <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for you, I'm sorry. It would take a lot. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, that healthy soil thing that I was trying to get across. Uh, there's some very interesting thing happening with soils that have now been in the cover crops, heavy residues for 20, even 30 years now. And they've got such a activity out there, including beneficial critters, all right? That includes the spiders and uh, insects. And there is no question in my mind that they're feeding 
on the slugs and keeping them in check. Right? The slugs are still there, but the idea here is to keep that healthy balance. I don't know if that's answering your question, but absolutely. Yeah, and remember the slugs will feed on dead things too. There's plenty of dead things in those fields. I just talked to somebody that said that they put something in their field and they had they monitored the beneficials versus the unbeneficials. They had 600 non-beneficials and 3,000 beneficials. Yeah, they're doing that biological testing. Uh, I've seen some talks on that. Uh, I don't think it's where it needs to be just yet, but they're, yeah, it's, it's some interesting work because as we get into these heavier residue, long-term situations, there's a lot of things out there. I mentioned the springtails. Interesting things are happening out there. So we want to get to that healthy balance. Yes, sir. Hold, hold on to that just a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that, all right. But I, I will answer your question with some slides, yes. Thank you. Okay, yes. What about diatomaceous earth? Would that work? Zippo, no. <coughs> also, um, do uh, go to YouTube and do uh, slug control. There's some really interesting things there. To answer your question, they tried... Glass, they tried broken eggshells. Uh, I'm pretty sure they had DE there as well. Uh, another one, which I thought was great, was a uh, copper um, wiring surrounding the beer. that They were using beer to attract these slugs in to test their effectiveness. The best one was, and you've got to see this one, is a Tesla coil. They had hot wired to this coil around. That's fun, all right? <laughs> but to answer your question, DE needs a dry environment. You can do it in houses, in corners and stuff like that, but uh, it needs, once you get it into the field, it's gone. Yeah, it's not effective at all. Yes, one more question. I, I'm going to continue on. Sorry. Is there Please. Anything that draws them closer to the surface? Like if you have live material above the surface, does that draw them more up towards the surface? I, I don't know how to answer your question. There are, um, there's, it's been said, and I have no proof to this, that uh, if you, you don't see 95% of the slugs that are in your field situation. So there's, what, what that tells me, if it's any accurate, if there's any truth to that at all, most of them are still down deep, all right? And feeding on who knows what down below. And then really we're only fighting about maybe 5% of them. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. Well, I'm just trying to figure out, is there something that, like, if you had, like, live plant material, like your corn or your soybeans are coming up, I mean, is that actually drawing more sludge towards your surface? Or we have saw beer obviously draws them more towards the surface? I don't have the answer for you. It's a, it's a very fair question. I don't know. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on. I want you to see this. This is in regards to uh, using salt, uh, so you don't have to do this at home. All right? A slug is essentially a foot with 27,000 teeth, but that's not even their strangest quirk. Any five-year-old or gardening fanatic will know that putting salt on slugs will make them die a painful but fascinating death. This is because, like frogs, slugs have super permeable skin. Water molecules can move through it very easily in a process called osmosis. This is handy for keeping slugs nice and slimy on the outside. However, adding salt to the mucus makes a concentrated salt solution, tricking the slug into thinking its skin is too dry. And in a bid to even this out, water molecules move from inside the slug. Whereas sprinkling your cat with salt will do nothing but annoy it, Seasoning a slug will make it actually shrivel up. We've made this infograph so you don't have to try this at home. There you go, folks. For those who haven't done it yet, you've seen the movie, all right? All right, I'm going to get to uh, the, this man was asking about uh, how about seed-applied insecticides. First off, again, the seed-applied insecticides, uh, 
uh, the uh, neonix basically wrapped on there, it is insecticide. It's a nerve poison for insects. I already covered that as far as how it would work on slugs. You already know that it will not. But uh, they found some interesting things at Penn State. I want to share that with you. Uh, first off, uh, well, I'll just read along with you that uh, they, uh, they demonstrated in uh, side by side that uh, where they had cruiser treated seed, all right, they actually had lower yields in the end of the season. It's kind of like, what's that all about? So they did some further looking. And uh, they found higher populations of slugs where cruiser had been treated, all right, or the seed had been treated. All right, uh, hang on there. And, uh, of course, uh, as I already said, the slugs are unaffected by the neonix or the, uh, the insecticide on that seed. But uh, the predators, not, all right. Remember I was talking about pulling on uh, one strand of that spider web? All right, think about this. So what they found is that uh, the ground beetles, especially, of course, they are insects, and they're one of the major predators of slugs. All right, and so what they found is here this slug had either fed on or slithered <coughs> over a treated soybean, taking on some of that neonic, unaffected, but not so much for the beetles. And what they found is that about 60% of them were either killed or incapacitated. Meaning that if you incapacitate a ground beetle because it's a very active feeder, it's basically dead in the water because they have to have a constant food source. All right, uh, and this is way I, I wish all research were this neat, all right? Fewer ground beetles meant more slugs more slugs meant lower yields. Kind of an interesting study. All right. Uh, University, do they any studies like that? I'm sorry, is... Is Penn State the only university seeing that or researching? That, this is from John Tucker's lab at Penn State. And it, yes, that's what they're... Is anybody else looking at it? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. I plan on doing some research in that end this summer. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Some trapping in, in untreated and treated areas for the uh, brown beetle population. Cool. Yeah, you're going to use the pitfall traps? Yeah. or Yeah. Um, all right. A, a kind of a follow-up then. This is from Tuker's lab. This is in a deli cup now, but uh, they exposed or they placed a, uh, a slug, which you'll see revealed here in a second, with a uh, ground beetle. And... <laughs> If you're not sure what you know what a ground beetle is, as soon as you see this thing, you'll know because you've seen them before. They're just very, very fast runners. And this is uh, after contact, obviously. And then uh, they uh, moved away a little bit of soil to reveal the gray garden slug. All right, and then thus you can see the result on the beetle. So again, this is one of those unintended consequences and again, who knows what's going else is going on that we just don't know about yet. I'm glad you're going to do some of that, Curtis. That's really neat. All right, um, and I think uh, I might end it here, but uh, there are several natural enemies. Um, birds do love to feed on slugs, uh, but I don't know that's a good thing because I don't know that you want a lot of geese out into your emerging corn because you've seen what happens. <laughs> Uh, same thing with sandhill cranes. Um, and uh, Now, toads are kind of cool, but the problem is they like it real moist out there. And uh, you can see Mr. Toy the toad there, very, very happy right there, right amongst the chickweed. Well, that's not a, really a good thing either. That might bring in some cutworms or something. But, uh, and then, of course, uh, ground beetles, uh, fireflies, rove beetles, etc., are all working in our favor out there. They're all predators. And uh, so, again, finding that healthy balance, I think that's what's going to be very, very interesting. Um, and it's going to take some time, folks. It may not happen in our lifetime, but uh, it's going to happen, all right? So I think I'm going to end it right there, Curtis. Uh,